Welcome to Inaudible. I'm your host, Jeremy Wyland. On this podcast, we discuss the weird, beautiful channeled messages found in the long tradition of contact with the Confederation of Planets in service to the One Infinite Creator. These messages articulate a philosophy of spiritual evolution, popularly known as the Law of One. Many of these messages are available to listen to on our sister podcast, Living Love and Light, available on all platforms. We seek to provide analysis and commentary on this philosophy described in these messages, identifying the common themes, and grappling with the application of this information to our human lives. However, we are not counselors, gurus, or experts of any kind, so please evaluate our words in light of our shortcomings and use your own best judgment. Thanks for listening, and I am very happy to welcome to the podcast Jamie Leastman. Uh, Jamie is an Other Selves Working Group member, uh, and she recently, in the not-too-distant past, gave a presentation to our group on dream work, and I wanted to bring her on the podcast to elaborate on uh, the very uh, interesting ideas that she brought up about how to work with dreams and how this relates to the law of one. So, Jamie, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. My pleasure. Okay, so... um, what I wanted to ask you about, first of all, was, uh, you know, before the podcast, we had talked about, you know, what's valuable in dreams? How do you approach dreams? And you were able to put it very succinctly. Uh, it's about getting to know oneself better through dreams. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. I um, have been journaling my dreams pretty regularly since 2011. And that's where a lot of my um, real deep self-discovery digging has taken place. But even before, even before I started being a, a really focused on dream work, I was always fascinated about what um, what what I was up to when I was asleep. Like I, my conscious mind would be asleep, but um, I would have these wild dreams where I would be defying physics. I would be interacting with interesting characters. I would be having nightmares and I would all, all these things. And it, it just always seemed interesting to me that there's this mysterious part of myself that I don't really know very well. This part called the subconscious or whatever you want to call it, the unveiled mind. But, um, it always seemed like the dream and being able to remember your dreams was a peek into inside like my inner self. And it always just seemed like this interesting mystery that I'm doing work. I'm doing things when I'm asleep. Yeah. There's, um, there's a lot of, uh, different activities that we can think about when we talk about, uh, what goes on in dreams. Uh, and, uh, so, what do you think uh, the major function of dreams are? I mean, I can talk about what Ra says, but what's your take on it? Well, I think the major function of dreams is to give you a peek under the veil or through the veil, however you want to phrase it. Um, and the the potential of yourself to not be confined by normal third density um, uh, physical conditions and also, um, like mental frameworks too. Like I can have dreams where I'm observing a drama where I'm not an active character in the dream, but I'm observing it. And there always seems to be coded messages and symbology and my, my all time favorite recurring dreams, which Mm -hmm. seem to be the most, succinct messages that your subconscious is telling you that, Hey, you've got to work on this. This is something that you haven't fully integrated or faced. And, uh, and there's an incredible potential for working with the shadow side of yourself, parts of yourself that you either haven't, um, that you don't want to face that you've suppressed. And um, there's so much potential really with DreamWorks. I could go on and on about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, that's a, that's a great way to approach it. And, and of course it's extremely consonant with what those of Ra say. Uh, there's a, there's a session in the Ra contact, uh, number 86, where I think most of the really pertinent information about dreams and how 
how we might uh, work with them best uh, is uh, laid out. And uh, those of Ross say in uh, question seven of that session, uh, I am Ross. Dreaming is an activity of communication through the veil of the unconscious mind and the conscious mind. The nature of this activity is wholly dependent upon the situation regarding the energy center blockages, activations, and crystallizations of a given mind-body-spirit complex. In one who is blocked at two of the three lower energy centers, dreaming will be of value in the polarization process, in that there will be a repetition of those portions of recent catalyst, as well as deeper held blockages, thereby giving the waking mind clues as to the nature of these blockages, and hints as to the possible changes in perception, which may lead to the unblocking. This type of dreaming or communication through veiled portions of the mind occurs also with those mind-body-spirit complexes which are functioning with far less blockage and enjoying the green ray activation or higher activation at those times at which the mind-body-spirit complex experiences catalyst, momentarily reblocking or baffling or otherwise distorting the flow of energy influx. Therefore, in all cases, it is useful to a mind-body-spirit complex to ponder the content and emotive resonance of dreams. So that strikes me as a mm -hmm. really stuffy way of saying what you just said much more right. cleanly and yeah. lucidly. Like, uh, that, that line that has been in my brain, uh, like as the kids say these days, living rent free in my brain <laughs> for many years, that it is useful to ponder the content and emotive resonance of dreams. Like that is such a... Um, an important thing to remember like people people always i mean if you haven't really delved super far into dreams you may be like worried about um some of like the mini dramas that may happen in your dream like you have a dream about um you know cheating on your husband or you have a dream that an awful nightmare where where someone is trying to kill you or you have killed someone else and and the focus on the conscious mind was like, you're a murderer, you're a cheater. But what's there are deeper, deeper levels there. And it's so much symbology to work through. And if you look at your dreams or c consider them for their emotive resonance, there is, it's not so much about like what happens physically. Cause that's what our conscious mind wants to do. Like, Oh, the physical, the senses, but there's so much um, emotional stuff to unpack there. I just, it's so exciting. And this earlier part, like the very beginning is that dreaming is an activity of communication through the veil of the unconscious mind or the conscious mind. Well, boom, there it is. Yep. That you are getting a peek um, through the veil. The veil has become semi-permanent or uh, semi-permeable. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it, it's important to understand that uh, the character of dreams are defined in part by this veiling process. And in fact, in an earlier session, uh, session 83, question three, those of Ra uh, describe, quote, the character of experience was altered drastically by the veiling process. In some cases, such as the dreaming and the contact with the higher self, the experience was quantitatively different due to the fact that the veiling is a primary cause of the value of dreams and is also the single door against which the higher self must stand awaiting entry. Before veiling, dreams were not for the purpose of using the so-called unconscious to further utilize catalysts, but were used to learn teach from teach learners within the inner planes, as well as those of outer origin of higher density. As you deal with each subject of which you spoke, you may observe during the veiling process, not a quantitative change in the experience, but a qualitative one. Um, so it's important to understand uh, the role that the veil plays here, because otherwise this would be a very, this would be a very streamlined and unmysterious transmission of information and okay. working through of uh, lessons that allow us to grow and unblock our energy centers. Right. And the other value, of course, that you talked about is um, dealing with catalyst. Like our conscious mind is so 
Like we're con in third density, we're constantly bombarded by catalysts. Like, and there, we have no hope to, you know, process and integrate all of it. But the one, the the catalyst that your subconscious mind may have deemed important is going to be reflected back to you in your dreams. And if it's even more important for your growth, you will give recurring dream themes with the same theme. And those are a gift, a, a real precious gift. Like how often do you get like a, um, like a, a pointer and a gauge or a compass? It's like, here, here is your catalyst. Why don't you ponder this? Like, I, th I think that's, it's so valuable. Absolutely. Uh, I have a lot of quotes here, so I'm using them to kind of punctuate our, our conversation. Uh, on April 12th, uh, 1989, those of Kuo talked about just what you were saying, and they say, it is important to remember the absolute necessity of the dreaming process. Therefore, even if you cannot remember the dreams at all, at least at first, never fear that you are lacking in the dream experience, but assume that there is some other reason for the dreams to be removed from the ability to recall. In some cases, perhaps it is not well that the conscious mind deal with that which the subconscious mind finds conflicting and difficult. This will, however, cause the one who does not remember the dreams finally to experience a clearer dreaming process, perhaps in a more dramatic manner, say, than the one who remembers dreams in a regular fashion and works with the images and their impact upon waking reality and what your, sorry, what your own spirit has undergone in order to withstand or bear the catalyst that you re-experience in the dream. And I think this is a very important point. Um, wow. A lot of what we talk about when we're talking about working with dreams is that which gets recorded in the memory of conscious waking consciousness. Um, but it's important to understand that this is a unified process that occurs in the total self and not simply in the self that we have access to regularly and without a lot of discipline. Um, and this catalyst that we endure in our lives and that works on us to transform us this is happening at levels below which we can really uh, consciously participate. And a lot of what we're doing, one of the things that I think is so valuable about working with dreams and the techniques that you have talked about, Jamie, is that it is a way for you to start to have this relationship on a concrete level with deeper parts of yourself and to learn the language that that deeper part of yourself uses to try to, 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 to reunite, to, to connect up and to have, uh, to, to, to use these dissonant experiences that we so blithely label catalyst as a growth tool that can be, uh, that, that can help us understand ourselves better. Right. Right. Well put, Jeremy. I, I have, um, there's an author and a lucid dream teacher. His name is Charlie Morley. He's written a couple books on lucid dreaming. And he has this quote, and I just love it so much. He says that every night your subconscious writes you a love letter. And once you start reading those letters, the, the better, the clearer the information will become. Like you will, you will start getting more pertinent and relevant information and you'll start to understand the language of your subconscious and it's just so cool so start reading your love letters <laughs> it's really also very striking to think of this as ultimately a loving act from self to self precisely because so many dreams are disturbing and mm -hmm. that they take you off your center um like uh there there are it is it is tough sometimes because I find that the dreams that are most challenging for me tend to put me in scenarios that are completely like impractical and in some cases alien. In other words, there has been all of this um there have been all of these things that have happened outside the context of the narrative of the dream that have created the situation where I'm in the dream in this situation. It doesn't make any sense in my waking life that I would be in that situation. Uh, <laughs> a, a great example is like the classic recurring dream of realizing that uh, I haven't been going to class all semester and exams right. are coming up. That would ne but that would never happen. You would never just skip for an entire semester and the administration <laughs> be like, oh, well, I guess he's got it. 
Like, and yet this is the feeling that you get a lot of times, this anxiety being processed on a low level. How does, and this, that also, uh, uh, speaks to this dichotomy, or maybe it's not a dichotomy between the content between the way, between the physical narrative way that these dreams unfurl themselves, uh, that that are that is comprehensible to us as a story, as an experience, and the emotional resonance underneath. So, like the the feelings that are created, and so often when we uh, when we think about working with our dreams and interpreting them, especially, we tend to focus on the events that come through. And not the emotional resonance. But those of Ra are very clear that the emotional resonance is where just as much, if not more, uh, didactic material lies. Right. That's It's good that you bring that up because, you know, I, when I journal my dreams, I want to write a narrative. Mm-hmm. And like sometimes the, the dream is very, um, <laughs> it's not a linear experience. Or, I mean, things happen in sequence, obviously, but um, we want to, um, when I I journal my conscious mind and I'm conscious, Jamie, is journaling the dreams like, oh, this happened and this happened. Um, But I do always try to um, journal like what what my feelings were during these these events. But it it is funny how when the conscious mind is journaling what what it uh, wants to do with the narrative of the dream or make it a narrative of some kind yeah that's that's a really good point um and i find it very difficult to record in a written language the the sometimes very very subtle emotional states that a dream is able to get you to it's like this very eerie almost uncanny sense that you have how are you supposed to take that then into the world Uh, If you're not, if you're not an experienced creative writer, um, (laughs) how are you supposed to convey that? I mean, I'm not Proust. I'm not, um, you know, DeLillo. I can't, I'm not one of these writers who can like convey that uncanny feeling through words. And I wouldn't have time to do it when I first wake up anyway. And I think that journaling tends to focus on those narrative elements because they're the easiest to capture. Right. Right. Well, I mean, often... Often the function of journaling isn't so much like, oh, I'm going to go back and read these old dreams. I hardly ever do that. It's just the routine of writing them down helps with the memory and um, re- remembering them. That's a really good point. You it's know, true. when I like, it, when it I- doesn't matter if it's like a like when I was traveling most recently, I was on a work trip and. Um, that's always exciting when you're on a different bed. You can have mm-hmm. like wilder dreams or something like, <laughs> or even like placebo yourself into thinking like, oh, I'm going to have a wild dream because it's not my bed. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> like sometimes like, sometimes I, my dream recall is really advanced. I can really recall dreams. Sometimes I won't, I'll wait a couple days and then I'll write down the dream. And, um, but sometimes I I don't really, but I'll just write down like, the basic basics. Cause once, once you're, or like the basics of the situation, cause I do remember like my, my most recent apocalyptic dream where there was these giant birds attacking big cities. <laughs> and I just wrote in my dream journal, like uh dream with the giant birds. And now when I, when I think about it, I can remember so much from that dream, but I I'm further along the journaling discipline than, than most. But some, it's just the act of doing it for a long time that really gets you in the habit of recalling your dreams. And, and thereby recalling what's that emotional resonance that's valuable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's almost like the narrative elements are sort of conscious index points into these feeling tones. Yeah, that's like, it. They that's give a us theory. a handle. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, and and it's it's tough. Like uh, I remember, like when I first started studying the law of one, like t- over twenty years ago, I was waking up like four or five times a night just recording my dreams. And I would, and any time I would go back and read them, I'd be like, "Oh man, this is BS! Like, why am I going to all this trouble? This stuff doesn't make any sense." But I think <laughs> you're right. I think it's the discipline of writing this stuff down, and just like uh, uh, it's a habit. Don Elk- yeah, yeah, it it gets you in the habit of 
having this relationship, even if it's this kind of at you know arm's length, this relationship with your deeper self, where you don't demand that it disclose its secrets immediately. Like you are instead patient with it. And you have to build a body of work over time, just like Don Elkins approached uh, channeling as, well, we're never going to be able to prove its truth or value or anything based on like any kind of like investigation. The only way we'd be able to see what's actually going on here is by just accumulating a bunch of channeling data. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's true. As somebody who's read through the entire transcript library, I think it's in the wa- it's in the wash of all of the stuff that you start to see what's valuable about it. But that would never have been something that somebody could have explained to me uh, coherently up front. Yeah, you just you just keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I since I have been journaling for so long, like I don't always have time in the morning. Sometimes you know I'm a I work you know, 40 hours a week normally and like a busy human and third density. But w- since I have invested so much time in journaling as like something I do at least like three times a week minimum, I have programmed myself to um, reflect upon and remember my dreams upon waking in the morning. Sometimes I'll have like something interesting and my husband and I are still in bed. I'll be like, oh, I just dreamed about this and this and this. And when we're both still in bed, because it's, if you really want to get into like the dynamics of dream recall, like the best time to remember your dream is before you even move your body when you're still in the bed, the more that you move your physical body, the more um, raised up you are into the conscious mind. So if you can have that like nice hypnagogic um, time, where you can f- reflect on your dreams, like it, it, that's a really great time. And I have a couple other techniques where I, where I will um, connect a thread to a topic or a scene, and almost like you know when you, cavers are doing cave divers, they have this string that helps them navigate in the complete blackness. So I, I use a technique like that where I'll, I'll you know, make, in my mind mind's eye make like a a little string and I'll attach the string to different topics in the dream and it will help me remember and follow the path. That's really cool. It's once again, this way in which you're trying to index these things and you're coming up with different ways to use uh, the conscious portions of the mind to kind of give yourself a breadcrumb trail to these (laughs) unconscious portions. That's, that is really helpful. Are there any other techniques that you have? I was just thinking about indexing my dreams. That's so Virgo of me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, that's the main one. But it, it, ultimately, the most valuable thing that I have used as a technique is to is the uh, the journaling, or that really got me into much deeper dream recall. Um, there, there is ways that you can seed your dreams for the evening. Like, um, it's funny because I, I talked with another selves, um, working group member about this recently, about how, when we were children, we would have amazing dreams and like, we would have like a same kind of mental fantasy that we would have at night where we were, um, like I had one where I, it was, it was kind of like, I was just me and one other person and we were, had to, travel great distances and like beautiful scenes, riding horses and mountains and stuff. And I would had so much, um, uh, I could devote so much to this fantasy and I would have this and then it would often lead into the dreams. Well, I'm an adult now with adult concerns and a mortgage and work (laughs) drama. And so I don't really have that same sort of like um, discipline to, to seed my dreams or, or meditate like on before I go to sleep, like I would like to dream about, you know, this particular subject, or I'd like to become lucid in my dream. I'm not as adept at that, but that is another great way to, um, to seed your dreams for topics and learning. That's really interesting. I know that, um, 
there is that confederation uh, suggestion to do the balancing exercise uh, on a daily basis, usually in the evening, as a reflection on all of the events that have occurred that day and what catalytic um, resonance they might have. And you could see how doing that would be a kind of, sort of a dual purpose, right, of allowing you to consciously balance things. And then in the subconscious, there would be a seeding process that would take place and say, all right, these are the topics that I have uh, sort of uh, collated out of the material of my day. Uh, can you uh, just riff on this unconscious? And then right. that's your dream, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, like we've all seen a movie and then gone to sleep afterwards and had like a dream about that movie. I mean, that's a pretty common thing that most people have had. So that... Yeah that's real. That's how it works. Like you, the, your, the content of um, your dreams has very much to do about what you experienced in the previous day. That's part of like the functioning of dreaming for like rest and, and, um, and, you know, the catalyst and dealing with the um, integrating the catalyst and stuff like that. So. Yeah. And, and it's important to understand that this is uh, something that you have to work on over time. I, I imagine that you know, you didn't have total recall immediately on a consistent basis. It was something you had to work on. Like just the fact that you have the training, um, like you've trained yourself to even be alert to the idea that there's information to be thought about and remembered immediately upon awakening. Like how long did that take you to get to the point where that became a routine? Well, um, I like I really started I had this epic dream in 2011 that ultimately helped me change my life and um you know start focusing on um you know being I quit using drugs and um just kind of like turned my life around I ended up you know my husband and I both kind of did this at the same time but I had this dream that was basically it was, it was so impactful, this dream, that it helped me change my life. I mean, after having that dream, I didn't wake up the next day and stop using drugs. But it, that dream was so impactful. Like, it, and it was, I was shown a vision of my future, basically. Like, if I, I had, like, this, like, epiphany in the dream. It was so funny because it was just, like, like a, a big atrium. And once I had the epiphany, almost just, like, in that one, um, that one, the Simpsons movie where he has that... <laughs> epiphany after the throat breathing thing or the throat chanting and like everyone like claps for him like I basically had one of those where I like had my realization and then that was applauded and then it was like well if you complete this this will be your future and I was showing like a vision of my future and um although it didn't happen right away of course um that dream and, and the power of that dream over my conscious life really um, implanted in me like the power and the potential of dreams to really like like I think my higher self or subconscious had had enough and it was time for the big message for me and it was it w that's that's what I um helped me change my life and um it was brilliant and so the I didn't I did start journaling my dreams a little bit after that, but I suppose it really started, um, really started taking effect with the journaling and being able to, the good recall. It, it was a few years, you know, it took a few years to get to where I am today. Like that was a long time ago, but, and different entities are going to have different levels of success or like trouble with this too. Like I'm a pretty, um, I'm a very, I don't know. I, I am who I am and I, I don't, I'm not really good at meditating. I can't really having a still mind and sitting still is very difficult for me. It takes a lot of discipline. So I've kind of like my workaround for um, meditation, which I still do. I make myself do it. Um, but my workaround is to like, well, you can, you invest your study in dreaming because first of all, how efficient, right? We spend a third of our lives um, asleep. And the idea that you can do 
work on spiritual development and exploration while you're asleep is very appealing to someone like me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, I suppose like your original question, it, it can take a few years, but it doesn't necessarily have to like different people are, could possibly have a much more accelerated experience with, um, dream journaling and dream recall. Yeah, it sounds like something that happens when you're ready for it, like most mm-hmm. things. Yes. Um, and I, I, I'm super interested. I mean, you don't have to elaborate on it, but I just want to underline this idea that it never occurred to me that a deeper, a deeper relationship with one's dreams um, and using that as a spiritual tool, you know, none of us, well, I won't say that, a lot of us don't... Uh, Uh, excel at meditation um it's not where you know meditation isn't designed to uh i don't know if it's designed at all but it certainly isn't this thing where like you're either a good meditator you're a bad meditator the confederation (laughs) often says that it's the intention of doing so that creates the 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 basis for meditation to to help you and exactly like dreams uh the help may be occurring in ways that you can't even consciously observe. And so it's nice to think of dreaming as another tool in the belt. And it takes pressure off of meditation to serve all of your spiritual inquiry needs. If you can rely upon this constant feedback mechanism that occurs, you know, you know, for eight hours a day, uh, every day, um, then meditation can just be about sitting with yourself. It doesn't have to fulfill any other like conscious goals for you. And that that might make people a little bit, it might take the pressure off of people and give them a little bit more freedom to just experience meditation as it is and then experience sleeping as it is, right? Right. And even like like in Buddhist traditions and dream yoga, they meditate in their dreams. Like that is like you were speaking earlier, Jeremy, about um, like the subtle emotive um, states that you can be in while you're dreaming. Like with with my ego kind of switched off or completely or very subdued while mm-hmm. dreaming, it'd probably be a lot easier to meditate while you're dreaming. Who knew? <laughs> like that is a, a a possibility. Like dream yoga is a, is a very fascinating thing to look into. Can you? Do you know anything more about that? Because that sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, like the practice of dream yoga ultimately is to retain conscious awareness through the entire sleep process. Uh, and it, it is a form of, um, you know, meditation and, and enlightenment. And um, I mean, it, that takes a very long time and an incredible amount of discipline to, to achieve, especially to, um, like the deepest part of your sleep, like to remain conscious when you're in that pre REM sleep is just an incredible achievement. And, um, but it, that is like the weird ether space of, of conscious awareness. I think they describe it as a dazzling blackness where like, you're not even like, that's, that's how it's been described it, to be conscious of, in that, in that, uh, pre REM sleep. Wow. So it yeah, sounds weird. a little, it sounds a little bit like lucid dreaming. Am I, am I off kilter there? Well, yes, you would be lucid to, you know, to be, to being conscious while in the dream state is also known as lucid dreaming. So it would be lucid through the entire dream cycle. Cause you have like on average, I think it's like three or four REM cycles every evening. Like the first like two and a half to three hours of your sleep is just like dead to the world, total deep sleep. You're not dreaming. There's no REM activity. It's just basically the physical body is like um, resting and and doing its, its sleep thing. And then like the REM cycles, then you have like three of them where you, cause you may remember if you start remembering your dreams that you may have like three or four distinct different dreams in a night because as you, um, you go through like three cycles in the evening or in, in the morning. So like usually like the, which is nice because you have these dreams closer to when you wake up. So it's kind of starts at like, I don't know, 2 AM and then continues, you go through three REM cycles and then 
suddenly it's 7 a.m. and you're awake. So I, I wonder if the REM cycle is itself like the download part, whereas the rest of sleeping is like all in time space, all in this sort of like dream space. Um, right. And then and then like our minds are like, all right, here's all of this like incohate feeling tone stuff let's come up it's like being in the writer's room right it's like all right well let's come up with a script for this <laughs> the table read yeah, yeah. <laughs> when they when when he did describe the uh that the dazzling blackness i was just like oh i bet that's like time space like that's that's what it seemed like to me description of that what that would be absolutely yeah um Okay, where do we want to go from here? Um, so, oh, I, I remember I wanted to uh, ask you about interpretation. Do you have, I, I think that when a lot of people think about dream work, what comes to mind most readily is this kind of like idea that dreams ought to be interpreted, that the symbolism should be decoded for the uh, waking self. And um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Right. Well, I, I looked at a dream journal recently and it was just kind of funny. Like it was just so, after being like my own dream interpreter, like focusing on my own dreams for so long, the, uh, the dream dictionary that I looked at was so like trite and like random. Mm -hmm. Like I was just like, okay, because ultimately... <laughs> dreams are all a projection of your own psyche it's all you so there's so i always think of that and um in that aspect and also like dream characters different characters in your dreams are different portions of you different portions of your psyche so that that um scary murderer that was chasing you in that nightmare that you had a week ago that's a portion of your own consciousness that you have suppressed or rejected or or you're afraid of and that you haven't integrated it's not like oh i'm gonna be attacked next it's not like a prophetic dreams are so like rare that it'd be much more useful to you to think about all of your dream characters as a portion of yourself and that is something that i've found to be the most helpful when interpreting dreams i mean i I think don't buy yourself a dream dictionary. Make your own. Okay. <laughs> Make you, your own you, journal. You you answered the first question I've been trying to keep in mind ever since you started speaking, which is what the <laughs> hell is a dream dictionary? And it's pro it's some it's some like book you bought. Yeah, well it's funny. There was one in the Airbnb that I stayed at last week. They just had it by the bed, which is a cute little, they had a bunch of books in there, but they had a dream dictionary by the bed, which is a cute little like Airbnb thing. But I was just like, I remember looking at it, I was just like, whoa, my goodness. It's not nearly as good as the, um, the own um, realizations and work that I've done um, with my own journaling. And yeah, um, yeah. It kind of reminds me of how uh, incarnations are programmed, where at first, before one kind of like wakes up to the polarity one wants to pursue, uh, uh, catalyst and life experiences are programmed rather randomly, right? You're trying to like get an, a mind-body-spirit complex, uh, a good uh, array of different experiences that might uh, elicit a bias within that, that complex and thereby... Uh, uh, create a calling for one polarity or the other. Um, and it seems similar with dreams that, you know, maybe if you're a newer entity in third density, uh, you're just, uh, you know, sort of dumping all of the experience that, experiences that you've encountered uh, in your waking life and your subconscious is trying to make sense of it. But as you accumulate experience, you begin to have your own symbology. And, and those of Ra talk about this in session 95, question 18. Um, they, uh, so Don asks, uh, in processing the catalyst of dreams, is there a universal language of the unconscious mind which may be used to interpret the meaning of dreams? Or does each entity have a unique language of its unconscious mind which it may use to interpret the meaning of dreams? 
and those of Rasse, there is what might be called a partial vocabulary of the dreams due to the common heritage of all mind-body-spirit complexes. Due to each entity's unique incarnational experiences, there is an overlay which grows to be a larger and larger proportion of the dream vocabulary as the entity gains experience. Is that pretty much kind of how you see it, Jamie? Right. Yes. I, there are these common heritage themes. I think, I think especially like the one having to do with school, like that we all have, we talked about in the very beginning, like, Oh, I, I can't believe it. Am I, I missed a whole semester at my college. And then like, I think that might be one of those kind of common heritage ones because we are on the, like their density is the ultimate school of of spiritual development. Like we, pre-incarnation, we came here with a plan for certain development and certain lessons. And I think that sometimes these dreams, these fears are kind of your subconscious pushing through like, hey, (laughs) <laughs> you need to get on this. Like this is part of the, the school of third density and, and making the choice. Like, and I, I think that it's such a common dream or, or, you know, people have dreams where they go to school and they're, they're naked or something like, yeah. it's all, it's such a, I mean, obviously that there's this cultural indoctrination where we all go to school in some way or another, but I think it might be deeper than that. I think that there is like, we are in the, um, fire and brimstone of spiritual development here in third density there is a lot to learn our, you know our planet is you know pre almost at the very beginnings of fourth density there is a lot of tumultuous activity going on right now and um we are in our school our how we perceive school and training as as conscious entities is um i think that's i think it's, that's one of those common heritage dreams. Yeah, it's 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 uh it reminds me a lot of the way that those of Ra describe the very nature of mind itself, where you have the conscious mind, and you have the subconscious mind, and then as you go deeper, you have you know the planetary mind, uh the 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 the, the there, I think they talk about something like a national mind. I think they call it a racial mind, but I think what they really mean is like you know that culture that you're in. That mm-hmm. has a mind. And then you go all the way down to like the cosmic mind and the archetypal mind. So that at all of these levels, there are different layers of significance that we as mind, body, spirit complexes draw upon to create meaning. And like, it seems to me like this meaning that we create is, you know, uh, it, it's this very important thing that we do that our that our dreams are kind of participating in uh to augment the meaning that we find in our conscious minds you know sometimes we'll tell ourselves stories in this conscious or unconscious way about what's happening to us or the role we play in events or stuff like that and so it's not surprising to me whatsoever that there were this would be occurring at deeper levels and it's that 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 core resonance of significance that we feel in all of this, right? We may not be able to explain it right away, but we feel it. And it's that feeling that, in my mind, uh, gives us that thread that connects all these different layers up. Like you were talking about this thread that divers use uh, to yeah. find their way back. This is our way of finding our way back through these different levels of sort of, sort of being a self, right? Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, we're all like here in third density, st- heavily veiled, stumbling around in the dark, <laughs> figuring out our way. And the dreams are, um, are, are quite the, the main line of, um, you know, heavily sim- symbology, lots of symbology, but still like this is, a, it's such a, a useful tool to, um, consider the self and, um, learn and know yourself ultimately discipline of personality yeah and, and continuing on this uh this theme of you know discipline the personality and using dream interpretation as an instrument for that purpose uh i wanted to talk about this kuo uh quote from april 12th 1989 and those of kuo say the possibilities begin of course as we have said with the self 
one may see various aspects of the self painted into the dream landscape, so that one may see each portion of the self as a piece in a larger puzzle or portrait. The utilization of other entities and situations may well make correlations between a portion of the self and the environment outside of the self, and how the self relates to that environment. It is well in viewing any dream or portion of a dream to ask the self, if it is not obviously apparent, what each portion of the dream represents. When there is uncertainty, it is well to begin a process of, shall we call it, what if? What if that is so and so? What if that is myself as I relate to this person? What if that is this portion of myself from childhood? What if that is a portion of myself that had a certain experience recently? Ask any question which you can think of, for the conscious and unconscious mind will at this point feed likely possibilities to your conscious mind as you consider the dream and its meaning. Imagine as you consider each possibility that this is true for the time that you consider it. As this is done with each possibility, each what if, Examine the feeling within your heart so that when there is a recognition below the conscious level that you will be aware that the conscious mind has resonated in harmony with that possibility. Thus, you may utilize both the conscious and unconscious mind in the analysis of the dream episode. Brilliant. Yeah, that's that's a great technique Brilliant. that I don't think that I've given enough um, attention to because it seems so freaking obvious. And yet... <laughs> When we are trying to interpret, I mean, I don't know about you and I don't know about the listeners, but when I'm trying to interpret a dream, I sort of like come to the first thing that, 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 that comes to mind and leave it there. And if I can't figure something out, I kind of just throw it away. And maybe that's not the way to approach it. Maybe a better way to approach it is to start asking these questions. You have a few basic places to begin. What part of myself is that? What experience have I had recently that that might reflect? What lessons have I identified in my life that this might be uh, 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 related to? And this gives you a lot of good material with which to work on your dreams. It doesn't... I don't think that every single dream has to be a life-changing dream. I think you'd agree with me on that, Jamie. I do. Yes. But, but that is, sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. That is a brilliant way of um, thinking and um, reflecting on your dreams. Like there's these, like I have most, almost all of my dreams involve a group. It's a group. Like, like three to six people are in the group. I'm, it's a lot of <laughs> very yellow ray, very group oriented, but to think about like, well, what if that character is just me interacting in, in a certain way? Like what, these are just different facets of myself and working as a group. Like what a, it, that's a really great way to um, talk about, um, considering the dreams and their meaning, like what if, what if this? Like I've and going back to the interpretation of dreams, like the most valuable ones I find are the recurring dream themes, where you have yeah. the same theme again and again. Like that is basic. Like um, that is your unconscious mind really kind of pushing this one forward, or also like a part that you really haven't faced or understood something that you've suppressed, you haven't allowed an experience, you've, um, you've tried to control it, right? And oh, that being the yeah. opposite of um, accepting is control. So if you're trying to control something instead of letting, letting it have its moment, like that will probably, you know, give you a recurring dream theme. Now, now let me ask you this, because this is a connection I've never made before, but then I read this April 12th, 89 Kuo, and it may, started to make me think, um, on recurring dreams, do you often feel like you have a little bit more lucidity in those situations than maybe dreams that are a little bit more random and, and, and David Lynchian? <laughs> <laughs> um, not always. Okay. Um, I think that there is built in that opportunity for you to, oh, here we are again. There's this, just like the school dreams. Like I've had so many of those dreams. Like it's almost like, it's like here, here's your opportunity to become lucid and where I'll get really close to it, where I'll just be like, oh yeah, 
where like I'm, it's like, wait a minute, I've already graduated college. Yeah. Why am I worried about this? You know? I've had <laughs> like, that too. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's almost just like, oh, you're so close to um, um, conscious awareness within the dream. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think well, that um, it, it's twofold. It, it can be all those things. Like, like really meaty spiritual examination and um also like hey you could even do one better and become consciously aware and really engage with your your dream world well well let me just read this excerpt from this uh kuo session and let me get your response to it um and whatever whatever comes to mind because i thought this was really interesting and it, I, I i labeled it as a an excerpt on lucid dreaming but i think it actually has just as much if not more to do with recurring dreams so this is that april 12th 89 session and those of kuo say the other shall we say garden variety type of dream is the so-called clear dreaming where one feels one is conscious within the dream. It is unusual for an entity to be able to cause the dream body to move and accept the living consciousness of the living self. Therefore, it is difficult, for instance, to cause the self in the dream to move limbs, eyes, or mouth. However, it is perfectly possible to observe the self, and these dreams are normally easier to remember. These dreams of clarity come to you after a certain amount of suffering. It is not always relationships that cause one to suffer. One's progress through life may be a course which is causing suffering. One's lack of excellent equipment may be holding one back from what one feels to be one's true career. There are many, many things, beginning with those experiences within your younger times, that are linked in a chain throughout the years, where you as an entity have continually avoided balancing some certain disappointment, difficulty, or challenge. These dreams often recur. Common themes are loss of control, lack of preparation for a test, basically those feeling times which indicate some sort of fear or negative emotion which the self is attempting with which the self is attempting to deal while maintaining the integrity of the conscious mind. Dreaming is to be welcomed as it is an absolute spiritual necessity, an absolute physical necessity, and emotional and mental necessity. Therefore, not only the sleeping, but the dreaming is to be valued for these two simple things alone. Wow. Yes. A necessity on every level. Right. <laughs> Mind, body, and spirit. That yeah, I think, is... I think maybe I, 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 I didn't see the distinction that they were making. They were contrasting the lucid dream to the recurring dream. Right. Right. And I thought that they were saying that they were the same thing. So yeah, Jeremy needs to read a little closer. But it's very interesting to see uh, that we have some expectation on recurring dreams for them to become clearer and to and to become sharper uh, as we uh, deal with the suffering and catalysts of life that that creates the lessons that we're processing. Right. Right. Well, the um, well, the brilliance of having a um you know, clear dream or a lucid dream or, or is that you realize you are in a dream and you are safe. Like you are in there. Nothing can harm you. Nothing can hurt you. It is your, you're in your own mind. Sometimes it can be so exciting to achieve consciousness <laughs> within a dream that you, you just like, you fall right back out of lucidity because it's just so yeah. exciting and um, such an, an unusual and uncanny experience. But that is the extra benefit of like having a lucid dream or becoming conscious in a lucid dream is that you can remember the things that you consciously wanted to do in your dreams. Like one of the things I like to do is I will go up to my other dream characters and ask them what portion of myself they represent and like directly and kind of interrogate my dream characters a little bit on what part of me that they that represent, which is fascinating. And also like in a more recent lucid dream, I had spoke to a couple dream characters and what they said they represented was a little odd or a little like weird. But then there was one who said that, and it was a, um, a tiny 
a, a very short in stature, balding man who just looked terrified. And I asked him what he represented. And he said that he represented death. And he was so terrified. And I went up to this dream character and I gave him a hug Mm -hmm. and I I gave him some love. And he whispered something else in my ear that he had been working with another friend of mine, someone who had recently had a brush with cancer, colon cancer. And um, it was just, that was one of the, the main instructions from this lucid dream trainer, Charlie Morley. I've read a couple of his books. So he said, the most important thing is to, react or to conduct yourself with ultimate kindness and acceptance in your dreams to always accept your other dream characters, hug them, show them love. And um, that's something that I, I've taken very seriously if I have a lucid dream, which are pretty rare. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I, I can't think of many times that I feel like my dream has been like something I'm participating consciously in versus something that's just kind of like a movie that I'm watching. And like, I might be super identified with the character in the movie, but I'll find myself doing something that, you know, I just can't see myself consciously choosing. Um, uh, Kuo has a, uh, uh, an excerpt that can tie all this stuff up with characters and dreams. Um, And they say the significance in general for entities which appear in the dream is that the entity represents some aspect of the self, that this can be the case with a stranger. I think the question was about um, what happens when you encounter strangers that people you don't know in your dreams, that this can be the case with a stranger underlines the quality of the self that has been seen, or as you might say, projected upon the entity that is the stranger. In this instance, we would suggest that the unconscious mind is able to perceive a quality within the stranger that is obvious enough in importance to the conscious mind, being a significant aspect of the self, to bring to the attention of the self this quality. The quality may be felt rather than defined by the unconscious mind. Therefore, the strange entity, one unknown to the conscious self, is chosen in order that this feeling tone might be easily made apparent rather than finding this quality within an unknown entity and risking the coloration of the quality with what is already known in the familiar friend. All right. So we have this idea that everybody we encounter in a dream is some aspect of ourself. Um, have you ever had this con the, the stranger character in your dream? Yes, I, I have had numerous strangers in my dream. Like the, the the dream that I had where I referenced earlier that helped me change my life. Um, I, and this is kind of an interest, whenever there's going to be a, um, or it has been so far a kind of a significant or spiritually relevant discussion with another dream character, there's always a table involved. So I, I came up to a table, like one of those high top tables at a bar. And there was this man there, a complete stranger, to my conscious mind, like he, um, he, he looked like an older, like, um, Mexican or South American man. Cause he had really dark skin and black hair, but he was a stranger and he, you know, presented to me like the, the big, you know, question for me. So, um, yes, many strangers. <laughs> yeah. And I, I find it really interesting that they point out that it's, it's precisely to not color the message that the character's portion of the mind is bringing to you, to, to your awareness that yeah, the stranger is like, chosen because oh, otherwise, it's like a, yeah. It's like an anti-distortion filter. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah. So these principles come out and as long as we don't, you know, do you remember in book four of the law of one where they're going through the archetypal mind and they keep saying for each symbol, it seems like release it from its stricture. In other words, like, stop making sometimes sometimes the cigar is just a cigar right like you gotta (laughs) gotta you gotta get over it and you gotta take it on the whole resonance rather than forcing one piece to fit in a puzzle that gives your intellectual mind uh the comfort of thinking that you have it you know finally and forever all figured out um and in fact like there's there's a good rock quote about this in session 44 question 10 um, 
So uh, Don says, uh, each of us gets the signals and dreams. I have been aware of clear audience communication at least once in waking up. Can you suggest a method whereby we might, shall I say, nullify the effect of the influence that we don't want from a negative source? And those of Ross say, there are various methods. We shall offer the most available or simple to share the contact with a to share the difficult contact with the other selves associated with this working and to meditate in love for these senders of images and light for self and other selves is the most available means of nullifying the effects of such occurrences. To downgrade these experiences by the use of intellect or the disciplines of will is to invite the prolonging of the effects of the effects. Better, far better than to share and trust such experiences and join hearts and souls in love and light with compassion for the sender and armor for the self. So this got a little bit off kilter from what I wanted to talk about, but this whole idea of like forcing dreams into a rubric that the intellectual mind can sort of like, you know, say, okay, this, this dream is understood. I can go put it on a shelf and not think about it ever again. (laughs) Um, That's not, that's not the way to approach it. And I think it also is good. You were talking earlier about, you know, telling your husband about uh, dreams as soon as you wake up. And those of raw definitely uh, think that that is a more valuable way of processing it than this sort of, than treating it as um, like a literature class uh, assignment where you have to find the theme and the, uh, and all of the, uh, the, the, the different uh, motifs in it and just document them all. And then like, you know, write it up and, 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 and stick it on the shelf. Um, there is, this is not chiefly an intellectual experience. The intellect is in my understanding, a useful tool. It can help with this stitching together or this tying the thread together um, and I don't think that one should like, you know, completely uh, dispense with it and only go off of like intuition. You need all the aspects that your mind brings to bear. But I think what the dream experience uh, demands of the of the adept of the seeker is one in which there's a flexibility to approach the mind as it is disclosing itself in that way it's disclosing itself and to accept it as given and then to work with what you're given. And sometimes you are not. And I think this is the mistake I made 20 years ago, uh, keeping the dream journal is that is if I couldn't piece the puzzle together, then it was useless. And that is not the case. First of right. all, like you said, just the aspect of recall um, gives you a second experience of the dream and it gives right. it, and it gives you ability to read, to, to revisit those deeper resonances that maybe aren't designed to be understood. You know, I mean, after all, those of Ross say understanding is not of this density. Why should dreams be any different? Right. Right. I've caught myself a couple of times while journaling the dream where I can, I can like, wait a minute, like I might be embellishing this just so I can write a story sometimes. Like I, and it's all right. It's kind of, yeah, and so I've I've caught myself a couple times. I'm like, wait a minute, was that how it really was, Jamie? It probably wasn't. Like, it, it's like I'm still like I want to write a complete sentence. You know, yep. like I, you know, just the like the the very like putting things into um, uh, English language and writing them down, link, English language with all its limitations and whatnot. So, but it is even the act of journaling and then catching myself. That is part of the experience. Yeah. I can tell when my conscious mind is trying to edit or when I'm trying to like make it something that, and I just have to remember like, Jamie, these dream journals, they're not like for posterity. <laughs> right, right. Writing, writing is rewriting, but dream yeah. journaling is not rewriting. <laughs> right. So like, it's kind of funny um, sometimes how, how that happens. But, and again, too, with that, like the, in the Buddhist traditions, or like, I know that this, um, lucid dream teacher that I follow his, um, he has a lot of, uh, Buddhist, he's a Buddhist basically, but having this certain level of kindness and acceptance within you, having that attitude within your dreams is, um, so important because that like 
it helps allow and accept everything. Like that's what we're trying to achieve here is acceptance of knowing and accepting and then ultimately becoming the creator. So having that um, attitude of um, accepting and allowing the experiences is very important for the adept, especially on the, on the positive path. Yeah, I agree. Well, um, speaking of uh, the adept and the positive path, there was one thing I wanted to bring up, which is, uh, you know, uh, those of Ra have talked about, and other sources, frankly, have talked about uh, the dream time being a place where we might teach or learn lessons uh, in a different capacity than our waking selves. Uh, do you have any experience with any kind of recall that 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 feels like that? Where I I am being given or I'm teaching a lesson. Yeah. Um, you know, not off the top of my head. I have had interesting dreams where I'm on like a like a craft, like a like a spaceship or some, and there's these big theaters, and there's you know classes going on, and I'm like. And I'm a part of that. Um, not so much as I'm a teacher, more of like I'm, um, I'm just like an uh, out of body observer. Yeah. Or I, I can I'm viewing like what's what's happening. Um, I guess I haven't had a teach. I think I've had. I'm not. I'm sure I've had that, but I just can't recall one off the top of my mind. But I think that. Um, no, that's that's fine. Like I haven't really had one like that either. But I think you actually brought up something interesting about this observational mode that yeah. we often are in in dreams. Um, there's a there's a there's another Kuo excerpt I found from the uh, April twelfth session that speaks to this. And those of Kuo say, the conscious mind, the conscious entity, moves through its life observing itself and its interactions with others. This many have called the observer. That which talks to the self, critiques, motivates, reacts. Just so. The unconscious mind has such an observer quality that has a far broader point of view and a greater wealth of resources to offer in its commentary upon the conscious life. Thus, through the dreaming process, is this commentary made available to the conscious self in order that both the conscious and unconscious portions of the mind, that male and that female quality, might be utilized in a fashion that, when well done, is of a balanced nature. Therefore, to rely only upon the conscious mind and its analysis of the life pattern is to utilize only half of the resources which are available to each entity within your illusion. Doesn't that say it all? Yeah, totally. I mean, that that observer role, I think most of us have had like a dream where we are not a, a physical character in the dream, but we're observing the dramas of the characters in the dream. I just had one just the other night and like, but that's so interesting too, because you, I mean, obviously our conscious minds, our ego or whatnot are, are observing ourselves sort of, but the unconscious mind would be the ultimate observer. And maybe when you're dreaming, you can be, the, you are the unconscious mind observing what your conscious mind is doing. Like me, like observing a group and it's drama. That'd be when I'm dreaming, it's subconscious Jamie observing what conscious Jamie is doing and interacting with all of the different aspects of her, her psyche. So yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah, totally. It's as, if, it's as if your conscious mind is this tiny aperture or focus that through which you're looking but it actually, uh, it that 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 waking consciousness is actually a very tapered version of a much larger aperture of your greater self. I say aperture because I I tend to think of these foci that the that we achieve in the creation that creates you know logo I sub logo I sub sub logo I like mind body spirit complexes as kind of these like foci of the creation that by focusing block out everything else and therefore the separation between self and other is illusorily created. And so as we uh, go into uh, unconscious states, 
by any means. I mean, I guess hypnosis could be one too, uh, some forms of meditation, uh, really, really uh, lucid experiences that are outside of, you know, the normal rules of uh, space time. Uh, you have these opportunities to dip into a greater well of self and realize how much you are the creation that you seem to uh, run up against and and simply interact with. This interaction of self and other self or self and creation is uh, just kind of like the same kind of narrative playing out that... um, that that dreams sort of recount as a narrative when in fact the the content the real the real meaning of the dream is much much deeper than what the symbols can possibly convey on their face and actually that's something i wanted to um i wanted to bring up to you do you ever find any value in using the tools of uh dream analysis and interpretation in waking life i think the most valuable thing is like in the dream, I, I'm confronted sometimes with a recurring dream of like, we'll say like my one recurring theme, dream theme um, is about having a sticky substance inside my mouth. I have like this gummy substance building off of my tongue and on my gums and I like try and scrape it out and then it just keeps coming back. So that's been a, a recurring dream theme for me. And it, it it kind of baffled me for a long time, like what this really means. Cause I'm, I've always been like a, you know, it has something to do with the mouth and communication and the, the face and, and the neck area, very kind of communication-y Blu-ray. And, and I've always been a relatively like confident woman. Like I, I'm not shy. I can speak my mind and I'm not really afraid of anything, but sometimes like there are things that I'm not expressing, things that I maybe need to get out, need to speak out on or express that I'm not. And so in the in my waking life, I think about this theme. I think about what am I not expressing? What am I not saying? And um, I had a really strong connection or learning about what this theme really mean, meant by having unexpressed anger because I had like an experience where um, that evening I just, I went to, I was pissed about a thing and I I went to bed mad and I, and I had that theme and it was, and I hadn't had it for a long time, but I had it and it was, I could felt it was directly connected to this experience where I was pissed off and I went to bed mad. And, um, and then more recently, I had that recurring dream theme a couple of weeks ago. And here I was, I was having this dinner with like the boss of my company. He's like the big guy. And like, he was t- talking about some stuff that I didn't really like, didn't really agree with. But like, since he's my boss, I can't fully say like, Hey, you're wrong about that, buddy. That's a pretty like f-ed up way of like looking at stuff. So again, I, I wasn't able to express I mean, I probably could have, but at what risk? You know, like I don't know. So again, I have this theme, and it helps me in my waking life really understand, like, that I am, like, for me to not express these things it has an effect on my higher self. Uh, has, has a deeper effect on me that so much that that my unconscious mind is reflecting it back to me through my dreams. So I know it's significant. I know that there's a, a, um, some gold to mine there. And uh, I think examining those recurring themes are some of the most helpful ways to, and also like, if you think about like, um, like you've told me about this, Jeremy, rubber ducking in programming in, in IT, when you, you have a way of like analyzing a problem or speaking about the problem, um, out loud. And then I think everybody, even outside the term rubber ducking, everybody has experiences. Like, I just need to say this out loud and then I'll understand mm-hmm. it better. Like that's a whole, it's a very real thing. So I think the same thing goes with dreams. I mean, if you're just in your head talking about, or like analyzing the, your dream, that's one thing. But if you actually try and express your feelings during the dream or talk about the dreams, you know, in weird symbology, then boom, you've like 
understood it and brought it out into the open in, in a whole new level. Sometimes the act of just explaining it. Like I talk to my husband in my bed sometimes still getting up, like it has such value. Dude, that is actually a really, really good point that I never thought about before, because what if the manifestation and the creation in general is a way in which the creator takes these incohate uh, like principles and ideals and feelings and all of this and through the act of making it concrete in the same way that we make our uh, thoughts and feelings concrete or our problems concrete uh, through discourse, discursively we're talking about it and that helps us see it better. What if the creation, the physical creation, is a way in which the creator is working out these things on its cosmic level? Oh, my God. We're, that's step three of discipline and the personality, becoming the creator. <laughs> oh, I'm skipping. I'm skipping steps, dear listener. I'm sorry. <laughs> Luckily, Jamie's here to, to rope me in. But I, I totally but no, I understand what you're, what you're talking like, about. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. like, it's happening at these multiple levels. And if there's one thing that I've learned uh, in studying the Confederation philosophy, it's that, you know, this this thing is fractal and like the same patterns are happening. They're just happening at different levels, right? So like, like um, there's so many parts in the Law of One, uh, in the raw material where they talk about you recapitulate in some act in your life um, a process that is happening at the logo at the logoic level or at the creator's level, um, and like we're we're just we are going through the process of the creator understanding itself at these just it, but the, it's just happening at these different hierarchical levels. All of them are necessary. Um, all of them have value. Uh, but they're largely the same processes understood in these more or less distorted ways. Yeah. Yeah. And it just like, and like a, and a pop and it's popped into my head, but in like a pop culture level, we think about the popularity of a meme, right? Mm -hmm. A yeah. meme. And it has like a, um, has an image that would be otherwise unrelated to some sort of text that is, and it's often a joke or some sort of thing, but like, there's something about memes that they can really get in there because it's like that they can really, you can really identify with some of them and just like, oh, this, this expresses a thought that I could never just express with words because if there, there's it's other layers of meaning, I think it's just like, um, humans kind of really like, wow, this really reflects what I feel and see at the same time. So I think like, you know, everyone has their favorite little collection of memes. I got a whole folder on my phone, but like, you know, like that's, that's what we're after is more, more meaning, more feeling where there's, it, it's just, I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a great point because if you think of memes, there's a lot of care there. Well, Okay, I won't say a lot. There's at least a few characteristics that really remind me of dreams. One being that, you know, there's a sense in which a meme is defined by the very lack of aesthetic quality it has or the, the <laughs> fact that it's not art, right? It's not composed for beauty in the same way that art is. It's almost right. that its clumsiness is kind of like its charm. Yeah. Like it, it's kind of it's kind of disjointed and like cobbled together in Microsoft Paint or something like that. Sure. And like in the same way, often dreams feel very clunky and like, mm -hmm. oh, man, they they, they should have taken this back to the writer's room. Like this dream doesn't make any sense. And it's kind of like the very fact that it is uh, occurring in, su in, in in this really bizarre way is what calls out the meaning in it. Right. In the same right. way that a meme, it, in, in the way that it like jumbles things together and it's like pixelated and all of that, that's kind of what makes it so approachable. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It has a, a little magic to it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Man, this would, well, this would be a great place to uh, wrap up things uh, okay. unless you had some other stuff you wanted to talk about. Oh, man. We'll save that for the next session. Dreams part two. Yes. More dreams. The the recurring so podcast to, episode. Yeah. I think like, um, I'd like to talk more about, um, shadow work and, and nightmares. 
the the beautiful gift of a, a nightmare. <laughs> Uh, that was one thing in my notes that we didn't get to, and I would love to explore that. Um, so, uh, yeah, we we probably just, uh, you know, once we get over an hour, I'm kind of like, all right, we've asked a lot of the listener listening to the, you know, just us go <laughs> sure. on stream of consciousness. So I like to be, uh, I like to be uh, reasonable about that. But, you know, that's why we have the working group. So we can just, you know talk about whatever we want to and we know we're talking with people who are super interested in it um so uh and that's how you and i met and it's been fantastic having you in the working group yes. um uh so i and it's also been fantastic having you on this podcast episode thank you so much for joining jamie oh it's been fun I like spitballing with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. This is it's so great to have it, you know, we can just uh discursively break these things down and it's funny, you learn just as much from where, you know, you think that there's a deep subject to explore and you find you don't have a lot to talk about. That's just as 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 instructional as when you find you th you you talk about a topic that you don't think will be yielding very much insight. And then all of a sudden, just by talking about it with someone else who has thought about these things deeply, you 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 uncover this whole new uh, uh, sector. Uh, I've I've learned so much from uh, your your experiences with dreams. I'm really appreciative. Yeah, it's like spiritual rubber ducking. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, uh, we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, thanks again, Jamie. And um, we uh, will be recording uh, in another two weeks, uh, Nithin and I, uh, on some subject, but I don't know what that will be. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, let us know if you have any questions or anything like that where we, where we can help. Um, I will also in the notes include uh, Jamie's video presentation on dream work. Uh, there's a great discussion that happens afterwards. And this is what I think is really good about the working group is that we can have this trust circle where we can share these things. But sometimes we find things that uh, the public would benefit from. And it's nice when we can do that in a way that doesn't you know, invade privacy or anything like that, uh, where we can just share this stuff and then other people can benefit from it. And that's the spirit in which I approach this podcast. So thank you so much for listening. Let me know what's valuable and what's not valuable. And in the meantime, stay in the love and light.